Welcome to TPM Vids, where we talk all about theme parks and more. If you're new to the channel and like what you see, hit that subscribe button and click the bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video. You can also find us on all your favorite social media platforms. Since their inception in 1963, audio animatronics have become a staple way to tell stories in the theme parks. Audio animatronic, that's right. These larger-than-life three-dimensional animated figures gave way for a new genre of themed entertainment. The animatronic show was born in the Disney theme parks, and the Country Bear Jamboree set the precedent for what to expect. Now, did you know that Six Flags used to have a ripoff of the Country Bear Jamboree? It was called the Great Texas Longhorn Review, and it ran for 17 years at Astroworld. Now, this episode is the first of a series that will explore the history of animatronic attractions and their unfortunate downfall. From Disney to regional theme parks, family entertainment restaurants, Las Vegas, and so much more. Now today, sit back as we explore the origins of the country bears into what became Astroworld's Disney animatronic show ripoff. Our story begins with the Country Bear Jamboree, and the idea for the show actually came from Walt Disney himself. In 1965, Walt was planning to build a ski resort in California at Sequoia National Park. The site at Mineral King was planned to be a massive ski village with a five-story hotel, 14 ski lifts, shopping, dining, and more. Walt was planning 10 different restaurants, so he thought it would be fun for one of them to have a family animatronic show that could entertain diners. Coming off his success with Carousel of Progress at the 1964 New York World's Fair, Walt knew audiences were incredibly impressed with this audio animatronic technology. After all, Carousel of Progress was one of the most popular attractions at the fair. Walt was sure that he and his team could duplicate the carousel success at the ski resort. But this time, instead of life-size humanoid robots, he envisioned life-size bears that could sing, laugh, talk, and play musical instruments. The Sequoia region was filled with bears, so it would be a perfect fit. The project was given to Imagineer Mark Davis to lead the design, and along with Exitencio and Albertino, they all went to work to turn Walt's vision into a reality. They came up with about a dozen ideas that included country bears, Dixieland bears, and circus bears. They kept coming back to the country music idea, so Mark Davis began dreaming up some cartoon bears. When the team would find a humorous song, he'd draw a funny-looking bear to match the tune. By December of 1966, the treatment for the show was completed and every character was pretty much sketched. That's when Walt Disney came into Mark's office. He saw these drawings on the wall and uh, he laughed like hell. He walked down the hall and said goodbye. I never saw him after that. He never said goodbye to anybody in his life. Well, I'll see you next week or something. Probably the last laugh he had was these bear drawings. Just two weeks later, Walt Disney would pass away on December 16, 1966, leaving behind a legacy and many unfinished projects. The Disney World project in Florida and Disney's Mineral King Ski Resort were both in the planning stages at the same time. As work moved forward on the Florida project, Disney's Mineral King Ski Resort would experience complications and delays. So, the Imagineers decided the animatronic bears would get a couple of tweaks and instead find a home in sunny Florida. The Country Western Bear Show was not only a perfect fit for Frontierland, but it was like having another piece of Walt Disney in Florida. He never got to see any of his Florida dream realized, and since the Country Bears was one of the last attractions Walt Disney himself was involved with, having them there was even more special. When Magic Kingdom opened on October 1st, 1971, the park was home to four animatronic shows. Hall of Presidents, The Country Bear Jamboree, Tropical Serenade, and The Mickey Mouse Review. Sure, there were fancy new rides, but visitors left the park enjoying the animatronic shows the most. The Country Bear Jamboree was arguably the most popular, and I mean, what's there not to love? These life-sized singing cartoon bears were unlike anything audiences had seen before, and the line would constantly spill out into the walkway. 
Disney figured out the perfect formula that combined fast-paced humor with music, creating a novel entertainment experience for the entire family. Disney's sophisticated audio animatronic system continued to wow guests, and it was here the success of the animatronic musical review was born. It wasn't long before the Country Bear Jamboree would make its way to Disneyland. The show opened in March of 1972, but contrary to popular belief, the success of the bears in Florida had nothing to do with it making its way to California. Plans to bring a duplicate of the Country Bear Jamboree were already set before Walt Disney World even opened, and construction started in mid-September 1971. Now like its Walt Disney World counterpart, the attraction at Disneyland was by far the most popular animatronic show at the park. Disney's animatronic musical review was still a hit. So in 1974, the park would welcome America Sings to celebrate America's bicentennial. This time, instead of singing bears, it featured a variety of singing critters, from gators to geese, chickens, frogs, foxes, and dogs. Like the bears, all these characters were larger than life, and the show was very impressive. America Sings added variety to the attraction lineup, and it did what Disney does best – capitalize on creating attractions that resonate with young and old alike. This was the charm of parks like Disneyland and Magic Kingdom. The problem was that not everyone was able to travel to Florida or California. In the 1970s, more Americans were looking for regional family entertainment, and it started the theme park boom. The United States saw more theme parks built in the 1970s than any other period of time. It jumped from 10 to 26 parks by the end of the decade. Regional theme parks were popping up everywhere, but the market became saturated very quickly. They had to find ways to stand out, so by the mid-70s, it started the era of roller coaster wars. Parks began investing millions to build the fastest, tallest, and best roller coasters to attract thrill seekers. There was one chain, though, in particular that became well known for its intense thrill rides. That chain was Six Flags. By 1980, Six Flags was operating six theme parks, which included Astro World in Houston, Texas. When the park first opened in 1968, Astro World took a lot of inspiration from Disney and included many family elements that made the park so successful. There was a full-size train, the Astro Way, Lost World Adventure was their version of the Jungle Cruise, there were live shows with original characters, the Alpine Sleigh Ride was kind of like their Matterhorn, and there was so much more. When Six Flags took over operations in 1975, all their contributions to the park were giant thrill rides. The only problem was that the medium age of their visitors was rising, and a lot of their new offerings excluded a large demographic of guests. Personally, I'd rather spend about a half hour slapping myself and get on a thrill ride. So what am I doing on the world's largest roller coaster? I can't answer that question right now. Perhaps I'll have more to say about it after I get back. As attendance continued to decline, Six Flags did not want the public thinking their parks were just for thrill seekers. They wanted to broaden their appeal again. What we've done this year is try to develop a new family ride, a total family adventure where all the family can ride. Thrilling and fun, but G-rated instead of, oh my gosh. Astroworld welcomed Thunder River in 1980, which was the first white water rafting ride ever installed. They were trying to boost attendance with this new family ride, in addition to increasing the availability of live entertainment. Six Flags began taking notes again from Disney's playbook, and they needed to bring more family fun back into Astroworld. They realized one of the missing pieces were the animatronic attractions, and that's when they decided to create an animatronic musical show of their own. So in summer of 1981, the Six Flags team turned to Gary Goddard Productions. They had just finished working on the Monster Plantation Dark Ride for Six Flags Over Georgia that year. The company was run by former Imagineer Gary Goddard, who was with Disney until 1979. During his time as a show designer for WED Enterprises, he worked with all the great Imagineers, like Mark Davis and Al Bertino. Creating an animatronic show in that Disney style would be no trouble for Goddard, and Astroworld knew two things for certain. 
They wanted the show to be a Western review, and it had to reflect the flavors of Texas. Since longhorn steers are popular animals in the state, it was decided the characters would be cartoon cows, steers, and other farm animals. One thing led to another, and storyboard sessions and gags, and coming up with ideas and songs, and what came out of that was the Great Texas Longhorn Review. Welcome to the Great Texas Longhorn Review. We're going to entertain ya, we'll sing and dance and move ya to laugh a little, cry a little too. So welcome to the Great Texas Longhorn Review. Regional theme parks in the United States had never seen an audio animatronic show of this scale. Actually, at the time, these weren't called animatronics. That was Disney's trademarked term. So instead, Goddard Productions were calling these animated theatronics, combining theater with electronics. Goddard worked with Advanced Animations in Connecticut on building the 16 massive robotic figures for the Great Texas Longhorn Review. Today, you'd actually recognize Advanced Animation's work on so many other theme park projects like Super Nintendo World, The Wizarding World of Harry Potter, and even Disney's Little Mermaid ride. They actually play such a big role in animatronic history, so you'll have to stay tuned to learn more about them in a future episode. Each of the 16 theatronic robots had up to 24 different movements, and although they weren't as sophisticated as Disney's figures, it was still a high-caliber production for a regional park. What's even more impressive is that the Great Texas Longhorn Review went from storyboard sketches to opening for guests in just seven months. It was a very quick turnaround, and Advanced Animations and Goddard Productions both worked together to install and program the show. In addition to the animated figures, the stage mechanics were pretty technical as well, with two turntables, a hydraulic lift, and two automated sliding platforms. The stage layout definitely followed the success of the Country Bear Jamboree. Velvet-covered sideshow turntables flanking the main stage in the center. Luckily, everything was retrofitted into an existing theater, and the show was ready to open on April 3rd, 1982. Yeah! <laughs> Introducing to that brand new Great Texas Longhorn Review at Astro World. It's a surefire way to get that good feeling inside. <laughs> Starring those other delights. If you don't care, get on your horse and ride. And the bomb steers. Oh, give me land. You'll be hollering for more. The Great Texas Longhorn Review at Astro World. The main goal of the Great Texas Longhorn Review was to broaden Astroworld's family appeal, and Goddard was pretty successful in achieving this. Uh, there are groups that can duplicate the kinds of things that Disney does in a much simpler fashion. I mean, there's nothing simple, but in a, a way that is economically feasible to groups outside of Disney. In five years, I hope we'll have character walking around on the stage. The character designs were all larger than life, and they had that Disney-esque charm. Each of them sang a variety of old tunes. <laughs> And there was a lot of punny humor. Thank you for that utterly delightful intro, gals. <laughs> this spur kicking, whip cracking hoedown was a really fun show. And not only did it look reminiscent of a certain jamboree, but it also sounded a lot like it too. Surely Goddard Productions wouldn't rip the script off a Disney attraction, now would they? And a great big howdy! To everybody here at the Texas Cow Palace. Slick Silvers definitely took some notes from Henry. Howdy, folks. Welcome to the one and only original country bear jamboree. Okay, I get it. Howdy is a common southern greeting, but how about the pun placement? So when you feel the mood, <laughs> Just refrain from hibernating. <laughs> and Slick's intro for Tex Glitter and the Bum Steers has a similar flavor to Henry's. Now, I give you a sorted assortment of executioners of music and song. I give you the classiest collection of country cowboys. Quite the alliteration. Those longhorns from Laredo. Now, when it comes time for the Bum Steer character intros, well, this will give you a little idea of what it was. There's T Bone on the fiddle who's known the price of fame. The gals all want his autograph, but he can't spell his name. With a crooked hickory bone. When the spirit moves that rune, he can make that pit of gold. 
You gotta hand it to the composer though. The song captured that fun western country tone really well. Oh, and it also had an identical ending to the Bear Band Serenade. So stomp your feet and clap those hands, you sons of pioneers. Give a yell about Yahoo for the boss, dear Balladeers. <laughs> now there are a few other Texas Longhorn characters that have their country bear counterparts. One of the more obvious ones are Calico Katie and her utter delights, which is clearly the cow version of the Sunset Bonnet Trio. Then there's Mademoiselle Fifi Lamou. This French cow who sings her show-stopping lament seems rooted in the iconic character of Teddy Bera. And the outspoken hound Buck Acorn is kind of like their Wendell. Then other characters grace the stage, like Tenderfoot Pete and the lonesome Armadillo. He would get quite the reaction. And we can't forget the obnoxious pup Gabby. He had a home on top of the proscenium and would chime in with a rough or two. Oh, and he sings. This was all something new for Astro World. Audiences just loved the show. I think it's fantastic because it gives not only children but adults the same enjoyment. Gary Goddard Productions may have taken inspiration from the Country Bear Jamboree, but the Great Texas Longhorn Review was an entertaining original show that had all the bells and whistles of a Disney attraction. The first version of the show played until the end of the 1988 season, and when Astroworld opened in 1989, the show became the All-Star Texas Country Music Review. Goddard Productions was not involved with this version of the show, and instead, Six Flags turned to Gene Patrick of GP Show Productions. They installed a brand new state-of-the-art show controller and lighting system, the characters were all repainted, and they received new costumes. There was now a new opening and closing number, and all the songs were updated with more modern tunes, like Dolly Parton's 9 to 5. Plus, the entire script was reworked. It kept the same spirit and tone of the original show, but it moved further away from being the Country Bear Jamboree. A new gag was even incorporated where the turntable revealed a walk-around version of Gabby pretending to be an animatronic. Then he would come to life right before the audience's eyes. A lot of money was invested in this refurbishment, and Six Flags was committed to keeping this attraction alive. The All-Star Texas Country Music Review entertained thousands of guests season after season. But as the years went on, it was losing popularity and wasn't impressing audiences like it once used to. Maintenance to keep the show running also became very expensive. So after a successful 17-year run, all the animals in the Crystal Cow Palace Theater took their final bow at the end of the 1999 season. The Great Texas Longhorn Review was closed for good. The show's demise was ironic, because part of the reason it ended was the exact same reason it began. There was a shift again in the theme park industry, and the late 90s were all about the biggest and best thrill rides. Even Disney was getting in on the action. Now around this time, Six Flags was now owned by Premier Parks, so while they knew how to run smaller amusement parks, they really didn't have any experience with theme parks. I'm sure this also has something to do with the show ending. The animatronics were then promptly removed from the theater, and this is where things get a bit muddy. At some point, most of the figures were sent to Frontier City in Oklahoma, which was another Six Flags park. It was either before or after Astroworld shut down for good in 2005. It's unsure if Frontier City ever had any intention on installing the show, but unfortunately, the animatronics ended up outside in the boneyard, and it wasn't looking good. Now, Tenderfoot, Pete, and Gabby are the only two figures confirmed to have been rescued, but now both of these animatronics are in the hands of private collectors. 
The Utter Delights and Buck Acorn are still believed to be out there somewhere, but the rest of the animatronics just rotted at Frontier City. The exact origin of these pictures couldn't be traced, but they appear to have been taken around 2016. In summer of 2019, Frontier City cleared their boneyard, and the animatronics disappeared from existence. They've never been seen again. The Great Texas Longhorn Review may have been a ripoff of the Country Bear Jamboree, but the show was a testament to Disney's influence in the theme park industry. It allowed a large-scale animatronic show to be accessible to the regional theme park market. Times now have definitely changed. Disney themselves haven't even developed a large-scale animatronic show since they built Epcot in 1982. Any show since has only used one animatronic. The Great Texas Longhorn Review marked a key point in theme park history, and it's probably something we'll never see happen again in a regional park. So had you ever heard about the Great Texas Longhorn Review before this video? What are your opinions on animatronic shows? Do you think they're still as entertaining as they once were? I'd love to know! Leave a comment down below to start a conversation, and don't forget to hit that like button if you enjoyed the video.